Hello everybody. Today we're going to go over several functions having to do with central tendency averages or measures of the middle, however you'd like to think about it. For the most part, these same functions will work in all spreadsheets, including numbers, which is what we're using, Excel, and Google Sheets. So for our first example, we have a table of data here, and we're going to use the average function. And before we actually use the average function, which returns the arithmetic mean, I just want to show you a quick example of how this is calculated. So let's say we have some numbers, and I'm just putting in, in some random numbers here. Okay, so the way this calculates is it's going to take these six numbers and add them up and sum them and then divide them by the numbers in that set. So in this case, it would be six. So let's show you another way that this could be done. Hit equals, sum, select your data set, and then divide it by, you could use a count, but let's, since it's real easy, we already know it's six numbers, let's go ahead and hit divided by six, hit the check mark, and we're getting 25.33. So if we use the average function, it should return the same arithmetic mean. It just saves you some steps. And it does. Okay? So, let's go back to our original data set. We have some dates and some 5K run times for those dates. And we want to know what our average 5K run time is. Okay? So, let's go ahead and hit equals. And always, as always, you can hit this function formula button to insert functions if you'd like. And you always have your function helper screen over here where you can select by category, by function, you can search, get information, you can select the function and insert it and so on. Or you can always just type it out and then try and find it. Hit enter. Let's put in our data set, which would be the times. And hit the check mark. And our average 5K runtime is 20 minutes and 31 seconds. Okay, so that's how you use the average function. Now on to the average A function. The average A function returns the average. And just like in the average function, it returns the arithmetic mean average of a collection of values including text and boolean. So essentially this average A function treats text and the boolean false as zero and it treats true as one. So let's go over some examples. Let's go ahead and use the average A select the data set hit the check mark that's for our data set one. And then our data set two we're going to use as a comparison. So let's go ahead and put in the same function again. Select our data set. Hit the check mark. Okay, you see we have the same data sets, same average. Now what happens if we change this one to the word true, which is a Boolean, the true Boolean nothing happens. The only thing that happens is it gives you a note that tells you that the formula is using a boolean in the place of a number. Okay, But the average doesn't change. Now, as I mentioned, words are treated as zero. So here we have a zero in the data set. If you put a word in, any word really, let's use apple, nothing changes because that's still treated as zero. And just to show you, you can put in anything. 
nothing changes, the word treated as zero, and also false, the Boolean false is treated as zero and nothing changes. Now if you put a word in somewhere else, then this is going to change. So let's show you. Let's put a word in here. Now it changes because that 112 number is now counted as a zero in this data set. Okay, so when might you use this average A function? Well, there's lots of reasons you might use it, but one of the main ones that I can think of is if you have a data set that's maybe not completely cleaned up and it has words in it or text and you wanted to do some calculations without having to do the cleanup, you could do that. Or if for some reason there's text in the data set and you don't want to get rid of it, but you want to do some calculations with just the numbers only, and you select the data set, there's text in it, that will be okay for your average calculation as long as you know what the booleans are doing in that data set. Then you should be able to do some average calculations even though there's strings in your data set or words in your data set. It will basically ignore those or treat those as zero and then you can do your calculations. I don't know how widely average A is used, but now you know a little bit about it and you can you can uh, use it in future data projects. Next up we have the average if function. The average if function returns the average, again the arithmetic mean, of the cells in a set that meets a given condition. Okay, so here we have a data set of numbers. Let's go ahead and show you an example of how to use the average if function. Hit equals. I'm just going to choose it from over here. And our test values would be the, in this case, would be the data set. And the condition would be, let's just choose an arb arbitrary condition, put it in parentheses, anything greater than 25. So that's going to average anything greater than 25, which would be 30 through 70. And in this case, we can leave the AVG values blank, or you can actually choose that same data set again. But I think it's easier just to leave it blank. Let's hit the check mark, and we get our average. Now, a quick check on this. To make sure it's right is you can select that data set, go down to the bottom of your screen and you'll see the average is 50. So it matches, we're good to go. Now let's show you again, if you choose this same data set, it's not going to change anything. It'll still work. And you might be asking why are there two of the same? seemingly the same criteria. Well, we'll show you how to use that in this next example right here. Okay, so let's just go ahead and delete that second data set criteria. Okay, so here we have some dates and similar to an earlier example, we have our dates and we have for those dates our 5k run times. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to know our runtimes average after 2014 is over. So it's going to come to this date and this date and this date. So and it's going to stop right here and it's only going to include any runtimes after this date. So it would be these runtimes here. So let's figure out how to do that. Go ahead and hit equals, put in your average if, and the test values, don't forget you have your helper screen over here, is a collection containing the values to be tested. 
okay? And then the AVG values is the optional, optional collection, as we saw earlier, that's the one we deleted, containing the values to be average. So the test values in this case would be the dates, and that's the condition. What you're going to put the condition on is the dates. So what we want to do is put these in, um, I always say parentheses, but I really mean quotes. Put those in quotes. And we want to say anything greater than, we, want, we don't want any dates in 2014. So let's just go ahead and use December 31st, 2014. So you see the greater than symbol and then the date. And then the last parameter would be the actual times. And hit your check mark. And we get an average time for anything after 2014. So it's not including it's not including this data here. We get an average time of 18 minutes, 20 seconds. Now let's double check that like we did before. What we can do is just simply select those times. And if the average at the bottom of the screen matches, then our formula worked. See, it does. Average 18 minutes, 20 seconds, 18 minutes, 20 seconds, and it matches. Okay? So again, let's just recap on that. Your first parameter would be the, I think it's easy to think of that as the data set that you're going to put the condition on. And in this case, it was the dates because we didn't want any dates to be included before 2015 or we didn't want 2014 in our data set. And then we used our condition. We set our condition greater than 2014. And then the third parameter was the actual numbers, dates, or times that you're going to use to find your average. Okay? Okay. So we just did the average if function, and now we're going to move on to the average ifs function. Very similar to the average if, the main difference with the average ifs is it allows you to add multiple criteria conditions to find an average. So we're going to use some of the same data we've used before. We're going to use our dates and our run times for those dates, but then we've added an extra criteria or condition with race terrain type and we have grass, road, and mixed. So what we want to do in this case is we want to know all of our, we want to know our average runtime for all of our times after 2014, but then we're going to add an extra condition, which is road. So we want to know our average times after 2014 when we ran on a road terrain type. So let's go ahead and get started. Hit the equals, put in our average ifs. And the setup of this formula and the parameters is slightly different than the average if. So in this case, the first parameter is the numbers that you're going to average. Then we have the test values and the condition for those test values. So let's do our first set, which is the date. And we only want to include the condition for those test values. We only want to include in, put those in quotes, anything after or greater than 2014. Next, let's just put a comma and we'll create another set. So in this case, our next criteria is the race terrain type. Choose the whole set. And we, now if 
This might be a little bit confusing. If you hit a comma, it's going to give you another test values, but that's actually where we want to put our conditions. So you can delete that, or you could just hit the quotes and put your condition in, and you can hit equals road, or you can leave the equals out. So what we have is this first parameter are the numbers or times that you want to average. Then we have a set of test values and its condition, another set of test values and its condition. So the first set we have the dates, anything after 2014. The second set we have the terrain type and we only want it to include road. So let's hit the check mark and we get an answer of 17 minutes and 9 seconds. Now let's do our check, because we always like to check, make sure things are calculating properly and that we've entered the formula in correctly. Okay, so let's go to our data set, go to 2015, because we don't want anything before then. And now we want to find the road times. So there's our first, we're going to include those. And then we want to select the next two roads there and there. And if the bottom of the screen matches, then we've done it right. And it does. The average is showing 17 minutes, 9 seconds. 17 minutes, 9 seconds. We're good to go. Okay, let's move on to the GeoMean function. The GeoMean function returns the geometric mean of the specified number values. The geometric mean is the nth root of the product of n numbers, and we'll come back to exactly what that means in just a second. The geometric mean is often used in financial calculations that look at returns over time and other growth figures such as population growth. The geometric mean is always the same as or less than the arithmetic mean. So now let's go back to the statement, the geometric mean is the nth root of the product of n numbers. And I think the easiest way to explain that is to give you an example. Okay, so let's say we have two numbers. Now, quick review, we know to calculate the arithmetic mean, we take the sum of all the numbers in our data set, and then we divide that sum by the number of elements in that data set. For the geometric mean, we take the product, so that would be the numbers multiplied together, and then we take the, the root of that product. And you know what root to take by the number of elements in the set. So here's our example. We have two numbers. To get the geometric mean, we would multiply 2 times 3, and then we would take the square root, because there's two numbers. If we have three numbers, we multiply 2 times 3 times 4, take the product, and then we take the cube root of that product. If we have four numbers. Uh, let's change that to a bigger number. Four numbers, we take 2 times 3 times 4 times 76, and then we take the fourth root of the product. And to drive the point home, let's add a fifth number. We take the product of all these numbers, these five numbers multiplied together, and we, then we take the fifth root, and so on. And that's how you calculate the geometric mean. So let's show you an example on a calculator. And we're going to actually use this to check our formula here. So let's say we have 4 times 9. We get our product of 36. Now to get the geometric mean, we take the square root of that. And we take the square root because the root is 2 and the number of elements we multiplied together is 2. And we get 6. So let's do our geometric mean formula. Select 4 and 9. And we get 6. So it matches the calculator. We know it's good. We know we're right. Okay. Now a quick note on the calculator. Let's say you wanted to multiply seven numbers together and get the geometric mean. So in that case, you'd have to take the seventh root of those seven numbers multiplied together. You notice 
we see the cube or the square root and the cube root. Well, to do that, you would take the product, multiply all those seven numbers together, and then hit this button and hit seven for the seventh root and hit equals, and that will give you the geometric mean. Okay, so that's a review of how to calculate the arithmetic mean and how to, the basics of how to calculate the geometric mean. Okay, so let's go over an example of where you might use the geometric mean. We have some data here, and we're looking at stock prices growth or decrease over time. So we're looking at the change in stock price over a period of about a year. We have our, our dates here, then we have our stock prices, and then we have our percent change. And quick side note, to calculate the percent change, all you have to do is take the new divided by the old minus one. There's other ways to do it, but I found this is the easiest. Okay, and then we have another column here that might be a little bit foreign, but we'll explain what this is and why you have to use it. Okay, so let's just start out and say we wanted to do the geometric mean based off of the percent change. Let's try and do that and see what happens. Put in our geo mean formula, choose our data set, hit the check mark, and we get an error. It says arguments one and later in geo mean must be greater than zero. Okay. So basically that means we cannot have negative values in our data elements that go into the geometric mean function. Now to get around that, what you do is you transform or change your percent change numbers to something else. And what we're going to do is we're going to call this the return relative. I've heard it called other things like growth factor or current value, but in this case, we're just gonna call it the return relative. And to get this, it's very simple. All you have to do is you take the percent change and add one, okay? And that will eliminate all of the negatives because negatives are not allowed in the geometric mean function. Okay. So now let's go ahead and try this. Geo mean, choose our return relative data set, which is just the percent change plus one, and hit the check mark. Well, that's huge. We know that's not right. Now, in a sense, to change this back to a normal number like we have in the percent change column, all we have to do, just as we added one here, we're going to kind of think of it as changing it back. We're going to minus one. Okay. And we get a geometric mean of 6.5%. Now let's compare that to the arithmetic mean. Now in the arithmetic mean, we were allowed to use the percent change numbers and we got 6.81. Some similar, close, but not the same. And another way, just to kind of show you, you can use the return relative numbers to calculate the arithmetic mean, but you have to do the same thing to that as you did to calculate the geometric mean, which is subtract one at the end. And you can see we subtracted one. And the percent change data set way of calculating matches the return relative way of calculating. Okay, so that's an example of where you might use the geometric mean using stock prices. So you might be asking why use the geometric mean instead of the arithmetic mean? Well, we have a near perfect example here that will show you why Sometimes using the arithmetic mean is not off or overstated, but just plain wrong. And that's why at times you want to use the geometric mean. Okay, so here we go. Let's say you start with $1,000. 
Then over some period of time, you get 100% return, which makes your $1,000 investment become $2,000. And then the next period of time, you lose 50% of that value, which takes your investment balance down to 1,000. So you went from a start to 100% return to losing 50% which took your initial balance of $1,000 to $2,000 back to $1,000. So your net gain is zero. Now, if you use the arithmetic mean in this case, this is showing your average return as 25%. Well, we know that 25% does not equate to a return of zero. If you use the geometric mean, you get the proper outcome, which is 0% because $0 return is 0%. And that is an example of when you would want to use the geometric mean as opposed to the arithmetic mean. Before we move on, let's talk about a few more things regarding the geometric mean. First, as you recall, we talked about how to come up with the percent change numbers from the changes in our stock prices over time and then translate the percent change into what we call the return relative, also called the growth factor, and I've heard it called other things as well, but we refer to it as the return relative, which is simply the percent change plus one. Well, there's an easier way to calculate the geometric mean using an array formula and this array formula helps cut cut down on a few steps such as this step right here now array formulas as far as i know are not available in numbers however they are available in excel and google sheets another thing i mentioned was the importance of using this return relative so you can use the geometric mean function because the geometric mean function does not accept negative values like this or this. And that is true and that is important. However, it's important to somehow translate these percent changes into a return relative form regardless of whether there's negative numbers or not. So, Having said that, we're going to go over to Google Sheets and we're going to show you how to use the array formula and we're also going to show you how to double check the outcomes of your geometric mean calculations. Here we are in Google Sheets, so let's show you how to use an array formula to calculate the geometric mean, and this allows you to combine steps, or I guess you could say cut out a step when you translate the percent growth to the growth factor or the return relative. Okay, so in order to do this, we're going to use our example from earlier. So when we said we start with $1,000 and then you get 100% return, which makes $2,000, and then the next period you get a negative 50% return, which takes your $2,000 back to $1,000, and we know when you go from $1,000 to $2,000 to $1,000, your actual growth, your actual net gain is zero. So you want your mean... Uh, the average of your returns over time to reflect that accurately. And as we saw before, the arithmetic mean does not do that correctly. So let's actually first show you that now. We use the average. And that gives us 25%, which we know zero net gain is not 25%. Okay. Now, so we don't have to put in an extra step and convert these to a different value, we can do it all in an array formula. Okay, so in order to do that, just hit equals array and then hit the geometric 
formula and then select your numbers and we're not finished but I'm going to show you what this does okay the it gives you an error and this is where before we would convert these numbers to the growth factor or return relative and in order to do that what we need to do is go into this formula and then we need to hit plus one and at uh, no not there in the range a1 to a2 hit plus one and then hit minus one okay and then the outcome is correct so that's how you use the array formula and if you put the plus one as you remember earlier we did this in several different steps we took the uh, percent change plus one to give us the growth factor return relative and then later once we did the geo formula at the end we hit minus one so we're combining all those steps into one array formula next let's go over how you can check your geometric mean outcomes and then see how they compare to an average mean outcome so here we have some population growth data we're starting in the year 2000 going to 2015 and then here we have our actual population growth numbers I've gone ahead and figured out the percent change and if you remember that's just taking the new number divided by the old number minus one and before in the numbers spreadsheet this next column that's where we took this percent change we added one to come up with our growth factor or return relative and instead of doing that we're going to use the array formula and then we're going to do a check so let's do the average first get that out of the way select our data set and we can see that the average growth is 23.92 now let's calculate the geometric so let's use the array formula and then put in the geo geometric mean and we select our data set we can close that now but you're gonna see it's 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 not correct so what I want to show you is let's do a comparison so you can see this 18.26 without the plus one and the minus one to transform it the plus one transform transforms it or changes it into the growth factor and that's the growth factor or the return relative is what the geometric mean formula needs and then the minus one is what changes it back into a number we can relate to or understand so this is without the plus one minus one and now we need to correct let's do it correctly and we put the plus one here and then the minus one here now the geometric mean that is correct is 22.63 so how do you know that's correct and that's a good question to ask because I love to double check things I'm rarely comfortable with just one answer without having a way to check things I think the actual checks is what is the most fun when you know that you have an easy way to do something and then you can check it and make sure that it's right so let's go over how you could check this first let's do the average check so to do the average check what we want to do is we want to take the start population times the average growth and we need to put in a plus one 
Actually, let's show you what happens when you don't. You're, you're, if you don't put in the plus one for the percent, then it's just giving you the partial percent. But you need the whole number, which accurately reflects the, the growth plus the previous population. Okay? So put in, let's put in plus one. And now that we have this first number, which is the start population times the average growth, then we can take this number and build on it and see, kind of project out based on this average growth percentage, what the growth should be in 2015. Okay, so let's hit equals this times and we want to use the average plus one and we need to lock this there's a keyboard shortcut to lock if you're on a Mac I'm not sure what it is if you're on a PC if you're on a Mac it's function F4 which is actually not easy to use so um, a lot of times I just go ahead and move my cursor over and put the dollar sign in front but we want to lock the row so we can go ahead and copy this formula down. Okay, copy it down. You always wanna do a random check to make sure it's calculating correctly. So this should be one above and then using this. One above, using this, that's right. One above, using this, that's correct. Okay, now let's do the, the cool check. And if this turns out right, it'll be very exciting. You'll know how to use the array formulas with the geometric mean, and you'll know how to check it. Okay, so let's hit equals. For the first one, we need to take the starting population number times the correct. Remember, this one's not correct. This correct geometric mean and plus one we need to lock the row because if we don't lock the row and we copy it down this will be relative and it will move down and it'll actually be referencing empty cells so we need to lock that row no that's not correct sorry for the first one we don't need to lock anything it wouldn't hurt anything if we did but Let's go ahead and use our start number times our geometric mean plus one. Okay, now we're going to go off of this, this number times our geometric mean. This is where we need to lock the row. Go ahead and put in the plus one, come back, lock that row. Now we should be able to copy this down. And if we've done this correctly, by the time we get here, this number should match this number. And it does. 21,321, 21,321. So what this is showing you is since we're using population growth, the average, the arithmetic mean of 23.92 is high and it's overstated and incorrect because when you project it out, you can see that it's 24, that almost 25,000, which is quite a bit higher than the actual. Now when we use the geometric mean, you can see that over time it evens itself out and it actually equals the last number based on this percentage here. This will give you a more accurate, more correct growth percentage. Okay, so that concludes our geometric mean and now we'll move on to our to the harmonic mean
Moving on to the harmine function. The harmine function returns the harmonic mean of the specified number of values. The specified number of values would be whatever data set you put into your formula or function. The harmonic mean is the reciprocal of the average of the reciprocals. And here is a visual of that. And we'll show you an example of how to calculate the harmonic mean down here in just a second. The harmonic mean tends, compared to the arithmetic mean, to mitigate the impact of large outliers and aggravate the impact of small ones. The harmonic mean is used in situations involving rates and ratios, and that's important, remember that, rates and ratios, such as the finance price per earnings ratios, average, averaging multiples, certain average speed calculations, and certain geometric calculations. Okay, so let's go over how you calculate the harmonic mean. Here we have a simple example of three numbers, one, two, and four. First thing we need to do is take the reciprocal of those numbers. The reciprocal of one is simply one or one over one. The reciprocal of two, you might not always think of this, but two is the same as two over one because if you divide two by one, you get two and the reciprocal of two over one is one over two. Same thing for four. Four is the same thing as four over one because if you divide four by one, you get four and the reciprocal of four over one is one over four. Then we need to take the average. And when I say average, I mean the arithmetic mean of those reciprocals. That equals 7 twelfths. And then you take the reciprocal of that, which is 1 and 5 sevenths, or 12 sevenths, or the decimal is 1.71. So the reciprocal of 7 twelfths can be any of these three answers, 1.71, which is the same as 1 and 5 sevenths, which is the same as 12 sevenths. And if you want to change the format of your answer, you can always go up here and you could put it in fraction form. Like we said, that's one and same as one and five sevenths. And just a little refresher, one and five sevenths is the same as 12 sevenths because if you transform this one into seven over seven, any, th any number over itself is the same as one. And we know it's seven over seven because the denominator of this fraction is seven. And if you take seven over seven plus five sevenths, you get one and five sevenths. Now let's change this back to a number, decimal. Okay, so that's how you calculate the harmonic mean. Let's go over some examples of when you might use the harmonic mean. The goal for this part is to help us better understand some of the logic and intuition behind the harmonic mean. Okay, so we have two companies here. We have their stock price, earnings per share, and P-E ratio. The P-E ratio is calculated by dividing the stock price by the earnings per share. And if you want to check this out, just go to Yahoo Finance, look up a company, find their stock price, divide it by the earnings per share, and that will give you their P-E ratio. I tried this out with several companies and it worked out perfectly. So just a little side note, if you want to try that out, you can go to Yahoo Finance. Okay, now if we take the arithmetic mean of these two P-E ratios, 12 and 309, we get 161. Okay, so intuitively you might think that seems right. Well, let's see what the harmonic mean shows us. Pull up the harmonic mean formula. We put in our data set, hit the check mark, and we get a harmonic mean of 24. And you might think, well, that seems really low. However, if we check this, one way we could look at this is by adding the two companies' stock price together. So we add $100 and $108, we get 208. Add up their earnings per share. So we add up eight dollars and twelve cents, thirty-five cents. We get eight forty-seven. And if we divide two hundred eight by eight forty-seven, 
we get a PE of 25. Okay, now this does appear to be more closely matched with the harmonic mean. So in this case, it does appear that the harmonic mean would be more appropriate to use. And this matches what we said earlier that the harmonic mean is used in situations involving rates and ratios, specifically the PE ratios and averaging multiples. Okay? So that's just a little example of comparing the harmonic mean to the arithmetic mean and why the harmonic mean might be more appropriate. For our second example, let's use speed, and the ratio will be miles per hour. Okay, so let's just say we have a trip we need to make. It's about 20 miles there and 20 miles back. We're in a hurry, and the traffic was good, so to get there, we were able to go 75 miles an hour. But on the way home, the traffic was horrible, and we creeped along and we were able to go about only about 10 miles per hour. Now you take the arithmetic mean of that and you get 42.5. You might think that makes sense. However, when you use the harmonic mean, you get a much lower value of 17.6. And this is where you have to ask yourself the question, which one makes more sense? Well, in this case, and since we mentioned that the harmonic mean oftentimes can be better when using ratios, we might go ahead and just assume that the harmonic mean is more appropriate in this situation. And the reason for that is that we spent much more time going ten at this speed here. So just as an example, we might have at this speed got to our destination in 15-20 minutes and at this speed it might have taken us around two hours. That might not be accurate, but just for example's sake. So you can see that at this lower speed it took us much more time and the harmonic mean might be more appropriate at taking that into account. Let's go over the median function. The median function returns the median value in a set of numbers. The median is the value where half the values in the set are less than the median and half or greater. If you have a odd number of elements in your data set, the median would be the number exactly in the middle. So that would be 2. If you have an even number, since there is no number exactly in the middle, it takes the two numbers in the middle and then it takes their average. So you can see that the median for 1, 2, 3, 4 is 2.5 because the average of 2 and 3, the two numbers in the middle, is 2.5. Also, when you're using the median function, it's probably a good idea to sort your data, but you don't have to for the median outcome to be correct. So we'll show you that. Here we have a simple example of numbers 1 through 5. They're out of order. The median in the data set of 1 through 5 is 3, and we'll show you that it works even though those numbers are out of order. Select your data set, hit the check mark, and we get the correct answer of 3. Okay, so here we have a real life example of when you might use the median to find a number that's representative of a data set. Here we have house prices. Let's just pretend that all of these houses are in close proximity. And as you can see, for the most part, the data is not that spread out. There's one outlier here. Uh, we have a very expensive house. And because of that reason, using the average on this data set here would be overstated and it would not be a accurate 
representation of the homes in this data set or in this area. Okay, so let's show you what the median returns. Put in the median function, select your data set, hit the check mark, and here we can see the median returns a house value of $131,000 as opposed to the average which returns a house value of $321,000. Now, if you could not see this data set and you saw these two numbers and you said these two numbers represent the house price for a given area, if you saw this number you would think that the house prices in this area are very expensive or you know somewhat high. I guess expensive is relative, but you would think that the, the most of the houses around this number in this area would probably be, you know, 200,000, 300,000, 400,000. Well, that's not the case at all. The case is that the houses are more likely to be around this number here, around 100,000 to 150,000. So as you can see, in this case, the median would be a better number, a better function to use as opposed to the average. Just keep in mind when you're using the median, make sure your data points are not too spread out, that, meaning that the numbers aren't in a range and there's a whole bunch of numbers in the middle where you have a real small number and a real large number and there's a, a large spread between all the data points. So make sure the data is not too spread out and if you see an outlier that's throwing the average then you might want to use the median or several outliers you could have a real low price too that would possibly throw the average okay so that is the median function and next we'll talk about the mode function the mode function returns the most frequently occurring value in a set of numeric values here we have our numeric values just pretend that this is a random sample of height in inches. Let's go ahead and calculate our mode. Put in the mode function. Select your data set. And hit the check mark. So our mode is 70. So that means in this data set, the height of 70 inches occurred most often. So you might be asking, how is this a good measure of central tendency? Well, for some data sets, mode is not really a good measure. It's not even appropriate to use, but for some it can be very good. The next step is to identify what types of data sets where mode could be relevant. And one of the first questions is do certain values repeat? So if you have no repeating values, the mode function probably wouldn't be very useful. Uh, the next thing you need to do is you need to kind of eyeball the data or do a visual of the data to find out how it is distributed. Okay, so for example, if you did a random sample of heights, and there's lots of data sets where this would work, heights, blood pressure, weights, grades, data sets like that, if you did a random sample and then you plotted out what they would look like visually, how they're distributed, a lot of those data sets would, if you did the sample right, form what is called a bell curve or a normal distribution. So if your data set is the type of data set that would normally form a bell curve, you would know that this mode number is relevant and it's relevant in the sense that it would fall right here in the center of the bell curve. It would be, that's your central tendency relevance. It would be right here in the middle and it would tell you something about your, your data set visually, okay? 
So that's how you use the mode function. Uh, we talked a little bit about what types of data sets might be relevant for using the mode and what, when you plot out your data, what it would look like, what the distribution would look like, and then also where that mode falls in a plot, a visual plot on the bell curve, right here in the middle. To conclude, I would like to suggest somewhat of a challenge, and that challenge is to come up with several different types of data, examples including housing prices, height, weight samples, ratios, acceleration speed data, stock price changes, baseball stats, and the list goes on and on, and then plug those into your average central tendency functions and see what happens. Then play with the data a little bit more, maybe throw in some high and low outliers, come back, see how the numbers have changed, and then do some comparing. And this will help give you a better intuitive sense of which of these functions just do not work for certain types of data and which ones work really well. That's all we have for the average central tendency functions. And be sure to join us again next time.